In order to build the future which is compatible with the two degree objectives, we need first to reduce the greenhouse effect gases, and this is considered as a burden that should be shared among the various countries. The Kyoto Protocol was elaborated with this in mind. The agreement which was ratified or rather implemented in 2005 uh, in the 16th of February 2005. The protocol was elaborated following the f this principle. Only northern countries were supposed to share the burden. Developing countries were exonerated. And the protocol covered a period going from 1990 to a sliding uh, deadline between 2008 and 2012. The protocol was not as successful as it was expected to be regarding greenhouse effect gases and their reduction, but its implementation made people think about key issues regarding the uh, commitments to be taken that we should talk about. First of all, the countries had to understand how to best share the burden. There were two options. The bottom-up option, each of the countries based on voluntary commitments, said, OK, I can reduce my emissions by so much. The top-down approach consisted in assigning greenhouse effect gas emission reduction to be then applied by the uh, emitting countries. The Kyoto Protocol, therefore, obeyed to the top-down approach supported by Europe because Europe thought that this was a way to impose a kind of climatic Allez, governance. However, it is difficult to measure emissions, we've already talked about that, and it is also difficult to organize sanctions for those countries that do not comply with their commitments if the framework is binding. And by the way, in the documents, the word sanction is not used as such because that would question the sovereignty of signatory countries. In the Kyoto Protocol, there are coercion mechanisms, but they do not stop some countries, from, such as Canada, from uh, exceeding the emission uh, limits and to decide to uh, exit, withdraw itself from the protocol with no reason at all. And Japan or Korea left the protocol at the end of the first phase so as not to be submitted to penalties during the second phase. Third issue regarding the agreement, the uh, reference year. Some countries, because they were suffering uh, economic or political turmoil, found themselves uh, well below the emission level that they uh, had uh, during the reference year, 1990. A good example would be Russia. Therefore, the next negotiations will also be about how to best share the burden. The negotiations will take place in Paris following the process that was started in Copenhagen. We tried again to understand how the climatic governance process could be studied by using a model that allows to study the long-term pathways or trajectories. We're going to focus on two of them, those that will allow the countries to comply with the two-degree objective. There is the gray curve at the bottom uh, representing the commitment taken by industrialized countries and emerging countries regarding a 95% reduction of uh, gases. Uh, and for developing countries, the uh, reduction would be 30% uh, compared with business as usual. And we also have another curve, a very, very close, with a two-degree constraint. In this scenario, we think that a climatic governance would impose the reduction in a top-down fashion. So two different logics are at play here, and we need to understand the underlying models. We need to make an effort to understand the underlying method, models. In order to comply with this vision of the future, some approaches were developed starting in the 1950s, and I'm going to describe them very quickly. 
the first approach is the so-called storytelling approach. A story is told that is believed in, and experts uh, share their opinion uh, with the others. The second approach is the backcasting approach. An objective is set, and then we go backwards with intermediate stages in order to understand how, if we consolidate the pathway, we will get to that two-degree objective. The last prospective approach is based on models, models regarding supply and demand, and this is the approach on which we developed our trajectories and I'm going to describe now this type of model, and I will tell you what we're referring to. We start from a demand on the long run, and the model will look at the technological progress which will provide the best cost efficacy solution. Now, the whole assumption is based on a planning system. Everything is centralized, and this is just something that will not function in the competitive world we live in. However, interestingly, because the modeling paradigm is based on optimization, the results produced by this model at least give us a hint of what we could think about in the best of cases, providing a bottom milestone regarding productive systems and emission levels. Oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you that we would limit ourselves to the energy system with a number of assumptions which match the fact that most of the uh, greenhouse emission gases are of anthropic origin. This model also has another strength. I'm going, not going to go into too many details, but the model provides a description of the various technologies and offers that will allow to reduce the energy request, and we will be able to think about substitution energies in a consistent way. Now, this graph that I showed you earlier shows a number of uh, pathways behind which we find an energy production system associated with a given area. The model divides the world in 16 regions, 16 areas. Now that we have opened the black box, we can start again the discussion on how best to share the burden, except that in this case the burden is the difference between the reference scenario, business as usual, in red at the top of the graph, and the climatic scenario, which in the first case would be the top-down vision of the burden sharing. The constraint is the two-degree scenario that will lead us to the climatic objective. 38 gigatons of CO2, 37.8 gigatons of CO2 are the burden that we need to share. And the world has been divided in three regions, industrialized countries, uh, fast-growing countries, and developing countries. It looks at first glance like the uh, burden sharing is fair, except that this would be a fairly superficial analysis and we need to take the reasoning one step further and look at this graph to understand what it really means in terms of evolution versus business as usual in the various areas involved. On the left-hand side, the scenarios describing business as usual in the three main regions. On the right-hand side, the results and the efforts made by each of the uh, areas in order to meet the climatic objective. And the uh, developing countries are obviously uh, suffering most because they must make an 84% reduction versus the business as usual scenario. Now, this result makes sense. We're not saying that the model is unfair and doesn't take into consideration regional specific features. Simply, the model acts where the cost efficacy compromise is the most profitable. And obviously, in developing countries, this is where the efforts should be made because this is where they would be both most efficient and cheapest to implement. Now, if we take a bottom-up scenario of the burden sharing, that is, the countries uh, take voluntary commitments, the sharing would be uh, 
very different. The developing countries at the bottom would carry a much smaller share of the burden. But in this case, the uh, objective is no longer the two degree scenario, but the one we saw earlier. Now, in order to conclude this analysis, one needs to understand that in this scenario, the uh, sharing would take into consideration regional specific features. If we compare the business as usual scenario with the new climatic scenario, we see that the effort is lighter for developing countries and heavier for emerge, fast emerging countries and industrialized countries. Therefore, we considered that emerging countries were not supposed to carry the blame, the historic burden of for emissions, or else they would not be required to make an 84% effort in gas emission reduction. The, uh, this is the approach that will be presiding over the next negotiations taking place in Paris in December during the COP21 conference.